associate professor uh, is a large associate professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the Uppsala University in uh, Sweden. And he's also, so he was telling me that he's also the director of the Swedish National Infrastructure for Computing, which is eating up a lot of his time now. Uh, so he, uh, he began his career in science by uh, doing his PhD uh, at the Uppsala University under the supervision of uh, uh, Bori uh, Johansson. Um, and he mainly focused on DFT uh, studies of magnetic rare earth and actinide materials. Uh, so he continued to two postdoctoral positions, so one at the uh, Forschungszentrum Jülich in Germany, uh, where he studied uh, long-range magnetic layer exchange interaction and at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington. Uh, and he's been developing and implementing general DFT-based uh, descriptions of non-collinear magnetism, which is uh, basically, yeah, the, the, the topic uh, you were working on uh, when, uh, when basically I was working in Uppsala where, when we met. Okay, so uh, after, uh, in uh, 1996, he got a permanent position at the Ongstrom Laboratory uh, at the Uppsala University, and his uh, current research covers uh, general methods and co-developments, models and calculations of exotic magnetism in materials, especially where spin orbit coupling plays a role. Uh, with specific focus on the description and calculation of exotic magnetism and superconductivity. And okay, so uh, I, I, I thank Lars again for agreeing uh, to giving this talk. And okay, let's now listen to him. Okay. Okay, thank you, Marco. I'll share my screen then. Uh, I have to try again. I don't know why it's... No, it is. Yeah, we can see it now. Thank you very much. All right, I'll talk about complex magnetic order and spontaneous spin and charge currents uh, in these systems. And as I said, uh, as Marco said, uh, I'm Lars Nordstrom and I'm at Uppsala University. Uh, the ideas or the presentation today is some ideas building up, not only in Uppsala, but in uh, several other places in the world. Uh, how to view uh, complex magnetic order, which has kind of changed, uh, at least my view. As Marco said, I, I was a PhD student last millennium, uh, where the view on magnetism was uh, one way, and it's kind of uh, consistent. It is in textbooks and everything. Uh, but the last years kind of has uh, shaken those really. Uh, uh, view of it and I have to view it slightly different and I'll try to give you the feeling for that and see if I fail. Uh, I am aware of that there might be a risk that I lose you in this discussion. Please help me by asking questions. Uh, there are no stupid questions, they are just me being unclear what I'm meaning. All right. Now I have to find a way to switch windows. Okay, so here is an outline. After the, a short introduction, I will talk about what is a spin current and what is a current in our systems. I'll briefly discuss magnetic symmetry because that is a, a, a basic origin to a lot of my discussions. And one example is we have kind of changed uh, the uh, the picture of it is orbital moments and their origins. I'll come back to that. And then I'll focus at the end on the magnetic energies. Uh, and in principle, kind of to look at the total energies you do get from calculations of electronic states in as accurate as you 
prefer. Uh, but then to map that into spin models where you have intraatomic exchange parameters. And we will find there might be non relativistic Shurashinsky Moria interaction. And if you don't really know what that is, I'll come back to that. And there might also be multi spin interactions. Uh, and they're all kind of fit together uh, and come back to the spin currents and currents I mentioned before here. In general, you can look at densities. Uh, charge density is what is uh, the basic of density functional theory. Uh, and that is kind of a good concept. People understand what that is. Then you have the spin magnetization, uh, which is you can also obtain quantum mechanically from these. Um, uh, let's see if I find the. Do you see my arrow? Probably not. Yes, yes, you we do, do see the arrow. Ah. Yeah, we see your arrow. Okay. It's, 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 it's not enough. like a pointer, but we see the arrow. Yeah. Yeah, oh, good. Uh, so the spin magnetization you can also get uh, uh, taking the spin dependent part of, of your eigenfunctions. The current is uh, not so much different. It is the expectation value of the gradient and the spin current is the spin dependent part uh, of, the, of the gradient. And these uh, two quantities uh, might vanish in a lot of systems, but you will, you will concentrate on systems where it will appear again. And these four densities, which are kind of uh, basic in uh, physics and chemistry of materials, uh, also have to fulfill the continuity equations. Uh, the time variance of the charge density is uh, balanced by the divergence of the current and the time dependence of the magnetization is balanced by this uh, divergence of the spin current and, and a precession term uh, involved too. So you have to kind of introduce the currents, uh, current densities. Uh, in this talk, I think I will avoid totally any discussion about external fields because there will not be external fields. So we will talk about currents and spin currents, uh, not due to an electric field, uh, but it will be spontaneous. When we solve the quantum mechanical equations, uh, we end up, uh, and for instance, we might end up where we have a spin up electron and a spin down electron, both moving, uh, one moving to the right and one moving to the left. Uh, which means it will not be a current in our systems, but there might, there will be a spin current. Uh, and the uh, spin uh, component will be said if we have the spin up and spin down along the set axis. And it will move along x in the, if you have this uh, uh, plane waves going in the x direction. Uh, if we instead have two spin up and spin down electrons uh, going in the same directions, uh, we will have a current in x direction and have no spin current in that direction. Uh, you can see there is a certain freedom uh, because if you would have taken the the component of the spin current along in the minus set, uh, that's the same thing as having a current going in the other direction. Uh, so the spin current has some freedom, uh, which is sometimes confusing. If you flip both the spin and the direction of the current, it's the same. In order to illustrate uh, what can happen, uh, I look at a simple model. Uh, there are three atoms, which has a magnetic field. You can say this field is due to that you have a moment and it's a wise field. But we just treat it as a, as a a field with a certain strength. And then we have a hopping in between the D three different atoms. And the magnetic field will be pointing uh, 
as this uh, with an azimuthal angle, alpha and beta here, but the beta will always be 120 degree rotate. So if this is zero, this is 120 and this is 240. And if you take the two three parameters, so the strength of the field and the strength of the hopping to be the same. So no three parameters. Uh, we can solve the, uh, this, the Hamiltonian for the eigenvalues. We get these, we have two lower states and we have two double general states, the green ones and these. So we have two states lower and four states upper. Uh, let's assume we have an occupation of two electrons. So the two lower states are filled. Uh, we have no spin degeneracy here because this is a magnetic. So it's only one, each band can hold one electron. Alpha, the co uh, this azimuth angle zero means all these three spins are pointing outwards. So that is what we call collinear. If alpha is pi half or 90 degrees, it will, all three will lying in the same plane rotated by 120 degrees. We call that coplanar magnetism. Now, if we calculate uh, the expectation value that is uh, the, uh, the probability that it will jump more in this direction than this direction, uh, we call a current. And if that is spin dependent, we can have three different components of the spin. So here I have plotted uh, the current. If you say these two are occupied, uh, we can actually divide, decompose it into the different states. And here is the angle. Uh, so here is the all moments outwards here in the plane and how you're all downwards. Uh, we can see here, uh, if you add them, some parts, they will not cancel for some directions, uh, they will cancel. Similar for the Y component. While for the Z component, they will never cancel because they're in the same direction. And if we, add the two uh, current contributions from the two different eigenstates, uh, we'll see that that will be like this. Uh, it will be zero at 90 degrees and will be zero at uh, zero degrees. Uh, but in between, there will be a current. And what we saw in the last figure uh, in a coplanar, we have the spin component uh, along said or perpendicular to the plane also to be a spin current is possible or actually if it's possible, it's almost always there. If there's not any other symmetry which forbids it. And the strength of this current is actually proportional to this uh, uh, scalar uh, chirality of the, of the H, uh, the different, the three different magnetic fields in the three different atoms. So what we'll see that we will have currents in certain uh, magnetic order and we will have spin currents in some other. And if you look at the magnetic symmetry, we can say uh, if we have a rotational axis, uh, we can see we either have currents along the axis or we have currents orbiting around this axis. The other two, uh, um, two components that uh, obey the, the, the symmetry. In the magnets, you will often have time mirror planes. Uh, that means mirror planes that also have a factor which changes the time reversal, uh, flips all the magnetic moments, for instance. We can see that the time reversal of a current changed the sign of it. The time reversal of a spin current changed the sign twice if you want or none at all uh, if you want. While inversion, uh, the currents are both behaving as currents and they will change sign. And if you look at the current, if you have a time mirror plane, uh, the uh, current has to be perpendicular to that plane. There uh, cannot be any component in that plane. It's not allowed by symmetry. While the spin currents, we can see the spin currents has to be transversal, the spin direction and the current direction has to be perpendicular to each other. And one of them has to be perpendicular and one has to be in the plane. 
So there are certain res symmetry restrictions on both the spin cards and the cards in the time mirror planes. I will not go through all other possible uh, symmetry operations in a magnetic space group as we essentially discussing here. Uh, the details are boring, uh, but this time mirror plane I will come back to. I have too many windows. I don't see, you know what I'm looking at. Okay. Uh, but we can also have magnetic symmetry when there are no spin orbit couple. Uh, that will be slightly different because if you don't have spin orbit coupling, uh, if we break, uh, you you don't have to combine rotation and spin in orbital space. So you can always do spin rotations uh, arbitrarily, and you can always do global spin rotations. And we are looking for two-fold spin rotations uh, because that has a special uh, meaning in our discussion here. But we're always allowed to do that. If you take collinear order, all moments are pointing in the same directions. Uh, the vector product between any moments uh, are zero. Uh, if, say, let's the, the moments are pointing in the set directions, uh, we can find two uh, operations which has global spin rotation, only spin, and not rota uh, orbital, uh, real space rotation, together with the time reversal symmetry. For instance, if we take the rot this rotation to be around x, uh, we'll rotate the moments from being positive Z to negative Z, and then the time reversal will switch it back. If we have this, two of them, we will see that the J has to be zero, and the spin vector, if we have only one, can uh, will be allowed to be invariant if we rotate around, let's say, X. Uh, the time reversal doesn't change it, uh, and this doesn't change it. So that will be symmetry. But there are two different perpendicular directions. You can have x and y, which means that spin current has to go away. So for collinear order, uh, these currents don't exist. And that is kind of a problem what I talk about for the uh, textbooks and uh, many going through this, is collinear order is the main discussion in many of these textbooks. And they are not uh, exceptional in a way. But if you learn everything from collinear order, uh, things will happen. You go to coplanar order, for instance. In a coplanar order, uh, all moments will be lying in one plane. So there will be no scalar uh, chirality uh, in between any three moments. It will always be zero. Now we can see we have one of these. Uh, time reversal spin rotation symmetries, and that is uh, for the normal vector perpendicular to the plane. So that component of the spin current uh, can be non-zero, and then usually is non-zero, while the current and the rest of the two spin components uh, of the spin currents are zero. If you go to a general order, which means uh, all different components or moments exist in our system, there is no access we can find to do this operation, and there are no restrictions on the spin currents and the currents in the system. So there will exist both currents and spin currents. All right, that is kind of, uh, I've said what I've said. Uh, uh, this may be enough, but I'll continue to see what this uh, has as influences to, to our system. So the calculations I'm talk will be talking about is kind of uh, based on density functionals. And in uh, the density functional theory is usually not magnetic. So what we might be interested in here is the spin density functional theory where you have two free per, uh, densities, two independent densities, the charge and magnetization density. Uh, you will have uh, a local uh, magnetic field corresponding to this uh, magnetization together with the local field coming from the charge density. 
And you can do uh, local approximations in both these, these two cases, and they work ex extraordinarily good. Uh, you can extend this. So instead of both having a charge, you can also have a charge current. And for that, you need a vector potential. Problem is here is non-local. And any approximation, even for the non-local, for this AXC to be a proper current density functional theory is of no use in the limits we are discussing here on an atomistic level. Uh, and you can also have a most general, which is spin current density functional theory, where both the charge density and the spin, uh, sorry, charge current and the spin current are behaving as independent densities would be non-local and the vector potential will now have both uh, scalar but also vector component uh, in spin. So we will stay in our calculation in uh, the SDFT, which works well. Uh, so if you don't have local, you might have semi-local to include gradients and everything. You still make good theory. If you want to have also charge and spin currents coming in, we can do DFT plus U. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I realized I had it in my abstract. I don't have time to do that, uh, to mention this now. Uh, I asked, uh, for you interested, I can ask questions about what I mean, but otherwise, uh, let's go on. So the orbital moments. Orbital moments are defined as, uh, some origin around some origin you have a, a, a current density and you integrate over all space uh, in order to get orbital moment so it has to be due to currents we have to have currents in our system to get an orbital moment a classical model uh, probably 100 years old or something in that order is the hans second rule probably not 100 yet but let's say eight 90, something like that. Uh, saying that you have an orbital moment and that would give you an or, or, uh, orbital uh, moment. Uh, you have an um, expectation value of the angular operator, uh, which gives you an orbital moment. But in order to have that, you have to have spin orbit coupling if we stay in uh, collinear systems, because as we saw in symmetry, uh, there will not be any currents, nor orbital in currents or anything, if uh, we don't include spin orbit coupling. So we break the spin uh, freedom to rotate by uh, 180 degrees. If you're allowed to do that, we will not get any currents and hence we will have not an orbital moment. Sorry. Now, lately, they're coming a modern model, uh, which is more based on uh, not atomic levels, uh, physics, but more on reciprocal space for, for, for solids. Uh, uh, but the, the result of that study is also that non-collinear order, uh, as this in, in this vector, this, sorry, spin carol, chirality of the three different moments, which means it's definitely what I call the general order here. Uh, you can have a charge current. And if you have a charge current, you will have orbital moments. And if you can by symmetry, you often have orbital moments. So if you take one example uh, a few years back, uh, where it was introducing what's called topological orbital moment. So the modern theory of uh, orbital moments uh, is based on uh, uh, Berry faces and an integration then of, of this quantity here uh, over the prevent zone. Uh, and for using that, people found that, for instance, if you have a flying carpet, that is one monolayer of uh, in the one 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 stacking of manganese uh, you can have a 3q magnetic order which is down here people are, the moments are pointing in, in four different directions and the total moments uh, uh, vanish they add out to zero 
Anyway, when you do the calculations, here is the, in the top, here you see the orbital moment as a function of filling, and the filling of the Fermi level is this horizontal line. You can see the orbital moment is non zero. Uh, in, in this plot is also shown in orange uh, what you get from an atomistic level uh, if you say that there are an angular momentum around uh, an atom, what it would look like. And it's not the same as this uh, orbital moment calculated by these barrel faces. So how do we understand that? Uh, can we understand it? Uh, what you can do is look at the symmetry. I will not bore you with that, uh, but you can see we can add down uh, to one triangles. All these triangles we can form can divide space or this plane here because it's a two dimensional plane into these triangles. They will all be the same. And what we can see is around each corner here, we have a rotational axis. So we know that we can have currents going around these axes. That's allowed by symmetry, as I mentioned in this a few slides back. Um, but we can see uh, in this uh, triangle, we can see we have three different uh, boundaries. And we can see the boundaries of these has to be uh, zero. The, the flux into this has to be zero. So the flux in here has to be the same as the flux out of B and C. But we can also view it as three different orbital moments. One orbiting around this one, going A and B and C is zero. Or around C2 here with B and C are non-zero and A is zero. And whenever B is zero, we're orbiting around C3. And atomic moment is the one uh, orbiting around S6, because S6 is the only one uh, which is an atomic center, while the C2 and C3 are intermediate points in our real space uh, units. So. so the deviation you had, sorry, between the orange and the red here, uh, in this view, would come from that also the current out of C here uh, is significant, which makes this not being a perfectly atomic moment. But we can still view it as local spin currents, uh, as complementary view of this uh, very phase calculations. Now we look at another application, which is manganese 3 tin. This is a coplanar antiferromagnet uh, with nail temperature 450K. It has a based on a, it's built up with a Kagamo lattice. Uh, if you ignore the brown tin atoms. And if magnetism in this is frustrated, you have triangles like this, uh, which together with a base, uh, dom dominantly anti order, which means there will be frustration in our system. And it's also used in what's called uh, a new area, which is called anti ferromagnetic spintronics, because it has a large anomalous hole effect, uh, experimentally and theoretically. Uh, and it has been well studied in recent years. In this study, we just concentrate on it. It has also a tiny weak ferromagnet. Uh, the moments don't cancel each other perfectly, but have a, a one thousandth of a Bohr magneton uh, per unit cell, uh, which are seen experimentally and are important because with the magnetic field, you can rotate this uh, tiny weak ferromagnet uh, in, the, in the plane, and you can kind of uh, handle this uh, antiferromagnet with the magnetic field, which I usually cannot. But how, how big does it become a weak ferromagnet? So this is the Kagomaya lattice, as I said. Uh, so there are two planes, and one of the planes is this, uh, this one, and it's like the Japanese Kagomaya baskets. And that is a typical frustrated uh, lattice giving rise to, can give rise to frustrated antiferromagnetism. 
and that's what happened here. The manganese three tin is also for me. I have read papers about that long for a long time because some of the early non-collinear children magnetist calculations by the pioneers for magnetic uh, calculations, which was Kübler and his group in Darmstadt, Germany. And also they could uh, do calculations with reproduce experiments well. And the ground state is of this term. If you take this triangle here, uh, the three moments are rotated by 120 degrees, but in the opposite direction to what uh, the direction of the atoms. Uh, a few years later, uh, Sandratsky, which was a pioneer from Russia, uh, had come to visit a big, got a position also in Darmstadt, and they had a paper together, which was the first relativistic and non-collinear calculations, and they correctly calculated the weak ferromagnetism. So I was aware of this for a long time ago, but this popped up again. Uh, of, of interest. Uh, we have we studied it more carefully. So the magnetic space group of this is what's referred to as 15-1, which is the space group, and then it's time, um, the magnetic breaking of that uh, space group is what's called 294. Uh, and whatever angle we have there when we rotate these two spins away from that direction, uh, gives the within the same space group except when it's 120. So that would mean that this triangle here have 120 uh, moments rotated, but all pointing outwards or inwards. Sorry. Uh, so what we did, we did calculations of, for instance, the spin current along the set. This is the coplanar will allow for set components of spin current. And the arrows here me, uh, shows that. And you see that kind of is the largest uh, amplitude of these spin currents is orbiting around this uh, uh, chimney uh, formed by these two triangles uh, around here. So the spin current will go spiraling upwards like this, but at the same time also orbiting downwards uh, along the same one. If you calculate the total energy for these systems uh, when we vary the angle here, we go from a ferromagnet to 120 degree, uh, which is the frustrated, which is almost a brown state. But then we go continue to go to 240, and we see that 240 is actually slightly lower than the 120. And then we go back to a ferromagnet, and this is an anti ferromagnet. If you try to map this into spin models, uh, current uh, to, uh, spin models have kind of nine de degrees of freedom. Uh, one is the Heisenberg, three of them is the DMI, and then you have the five rest of them, which are called anisotropic, uh, symmetric um, uh, <laughs> tensor uh, of rank two. And we can see here, here's the, what would be fitting to uh, Heisenberg plus Jusinska Moria. Uh, and it gets the ground state, uh, the, the minima correct, uh, but it doesn't fit, get all the features and they're kind of far away from some of them. And these calculations were done me uh, kind of uh, state of the art in, in non-collinear humanities. So how can we understand these deviations from a Heisenberg model? Uh, so traditionally, the one popular way to do uh, the calculated spin model parameters, not just fitting as we did, but to calculate them, is the LKG method, Liechtenstein, Katznol, Samantrop, Gubanov, from uh, in the 80s. Uh, they derived it for collinear uh, magnets without any spin orbit coupling. And the Heisenberg interaction uh, can be viewed as this, uh, calculated by this, where we have Green's functions here, uh, scattering off the magnetic uh, 
potential at the different sites. Uh, if you take a picture, we can say that it goes from side I as a spin up electron, scatters as side J and goes down as a down, uh, spin down electron, uh, pop, uh, propagated by these Green's functions. If we now introduce the Green's functions uh, as a matrix, we can view it as uh, G naught is the, the scalar here, and then we have a Z. Uh, giving the difference of these two uh, up and down. Uh, and we can formulate uh, the general Green's function as being dependent by do this decomposition into uh, uh, Pauli matrices. And then in principle, we could use this formulas to do even non-collinear. We don't have to stay in the collinear when we only have set components of the Green's functions. And we can also include this when we are, we can also use the you normal know, coupling and still use the same normal culture. However, we will run into some other problems and that's what we did here. Uh, so we'd start doing it from a ground state calculation and then we'll vary uh, some of the moments. And we'll see how that would change the energy and that is our interaction energies. Uh, and the low that will come is since this is a very weak perturbation, it could be infinitesimal, uh, uh, which means the energy differences will be only be due to the change in density of states. And if we integrate those, it's a change in number of states. And uh, this is what's called the Lloyd's uh, theorem uh, to get that. And you can write it down like this. So this is the lowest order change in the integrated density of states and you can view it as uh, the local field together with the local uh, greens functions the spin dependent part of it and you take the trace we will do further decomposition which we think is useful uh, so we split the spin independent and the spin independent part into two where we say that these green ones here with one at the end are odd if we change the two sides if it goes from one side to another uh, uh, it's the opposite than if you go from one uh, the second to the first while these in the whatever color that is uh, are instead invariant under in exchange of sides you can always do that. Uh, it's only two possibilities, odd or even, and we divide them into that. Having done that, we can see that using these Green's functions, we can calculate the charge density from this one, can calculate the minusization density from this one, and actually we can now calculate also the charge currents coming from these ones, which are odd. Uh, so the G naught zero here uh, gave you uh, the gradient of what that gave us the charge current and the gradient of the spin dependent uh, uh, odd uh, is the uh, spin current. And if you look at the time reversal properties, we can see that charge density and spin currents are even, while spin density and charge currents are odd. We already observed the that spin current is even and charge current is odd. So that is in, in correspondence to that, what we had before. Now, straightforwardly, uh, of course, I use straightforwardly not to have to go into the details. They're not complicated. It's usually using the Pauli algebra of spin matrices and some uh, linear algebra, what trace and whatever, uh, what you can do. But you can show, uh, that the local interaction you can actually view as coming, uh, sorry, the local spin dependent Green's function, you can see as coming from, going from that aside I to a magnetic atom and then going back with different, uh, th through the different channels, the charge density, the charge current, uh, spin current and the spin density. And you can have it in different ways like this. And that is what I call, will call a sum rule uh, for the, this part. 
And in a non-collinear, sorry, in a collinear systems, only these two uh, terms will uh, survive. And that is uh, in line with the LKG theory of the collinear ones. Uh, you can only go as up and down, uh, or in this case, as um, spin independent and a set component of the spin dependence. Uh, but we will have something here which acts as a vector product uh, of the moments. Uh, and that's called the Sulusinski Moria interactions, uh, which are supposed to be relativistic, uh, that because that was what Maria said in his calculations early on. And uh, Sulusinski used symmetries, and I was not so clear it has to be relativistic. So we, in principle, can use this. Uh, so instead of having the local green sanctions, we use our, uh, sorry, instead of using the local green sanctions in the Lloyd's formula we showed before, uh, we divide that into these different terms. And then we can look at it as a bilinear interaction. And if we include the Sulusinski Maria only, we have this one. So we can calculate these two. And there are two different terms. Uh, the trace of the spin degrees of freedom are already taken. So it's, this is only trace of the orbit degrees of freedom. And we have to integrate over all occupied states. We have to take the real part and everything. The computer is very good in doing all these nitty details. Uh, we could see that the first term consists of a charge density and a spin current, and the other one of a charge current and a spin density. Uh, this will be very close to what the terms way Moria calculated it, and this will have some add-ons to that. But we can now also see uh, that Moria could be also, sorry, the DMI can also be non-relativistic in origin, if we have a coplanar order or a non coplanar general order, uh, this term will be valid. Uh, both these two terms will be valid for a general order, but for a coplanar, this term will be valid. Uh, we can check this very, I will do this very quickly. Uh, you can check the details if you want. If you calculate the, uh, this, interaction from i to j uh, will be this term. We can say the trace of a matrix is the same as the matrix transposed. I uh, have a matrix transposed, we can shuffle or reshuffle the terms and take the transpose individually. And then what we see here, the g1 here, uh, j i, but that we can already notice that this is odd under inversion of spin uh, of the site indices, while this is even in the in site indices. So what we come down is that we get a minus coming from this uh, uh, spin current, that is a current involved in this interaction. And it is asymmetric uh, of the DM, which is very important in understand uh, the uh, magnetism of many materials. Uh, so we do calculations now for manganese 310. Uh, and we can say for the ground state, which was around 240 degrees, uh, we have actually uh, uh, Chilisinska Moriri interactions, which is about the same order of magnitude as this uh, Heisenberg, except that these are now non relativistic so you don't really need spin overcoupling to get them. Uh, what we can see if we vary this uh, by rotating these moments uh, here and here, that this direction and these directions are not identical. Uh, so we can use that effect to calculate the weak ferromagnetism. And if you compare the 120 and 240, which is almost the same, it's exactly the same if you ignore spin orbit coupling. But with the spin orbit coupling, we can see. Uh, that will be the two different interactions about the same size, so they will cancel each other, uh, balance each other, so they will stay in the same direction. But for 240, they will not balance each other anymore. And that 
is due to that we have here in this case three mirror uh, time mirror planes but here we have uh, only one and two of them are lost and this loss of time mirror planes gives a slight uh, uh, unbalance in the two different uh, dm interactions which gives rise to a weak ferromagnetic moment what we can also see is that our spin parameter the spin model parameters are reference dependent depends on where we are in our which magnetic order we are in uh, and that is natural kind of and spin currents strongly depend on which magnetic state we are in and they are important to cut uh, in the part of calculating parameters uh i'm not sure about the time uh only about 10 minutes left about Vish, if if you can wrap up in 10 okay. minutes okay yeah uh i'll wrap up when 10 minutes are gone i don't know how far maybe i'll finish uh so from first principle you can also look at the heisenberg interactions uh it will have now more terms in, in a collinear it's only had this and uh, that one but you'll have two other now coming from the two currents which can exist now in the in the truly general uh magnetic order And what we can see is that the charge density part one, the first term there, is kind of independent on the reference state. So here I vary the angles and the blue stays kind of constant. While the other ones, uh, the spin density, now the charge, yes, I got confused. You know, this is the spin density. Uh, it's dependent on, on the magnetic moment, uh, mag magnetic order. And also the uh, spin, the charge current, spin current, while well, the charge current is zero due to so this is a co-planar uh, order. In order to get any difference between the two different angles, we have to integrate these interaction terms uh, over the angle, but we can do that. And we get something like this. Uh, and you see it start to come closer to the, the total energy we had with another calculated by, by, by electronic states. So, uh, so the blue one is almost reference dependent, uh, reference independent, but the other ones are reference dependent. So the blue one was this one, reference independence almost. If you now look at the sum rule here and the term corresponding, giving rise to this independent uh, interaction. And then we had this one, uh, which do exist if we have SOC, and it's the DM interaction. But in principle, all these three terms here uh, in this rectangle are reference dependent. Uh, which we can see uh, as this first line, which includes the spin dependent uh, Green's functions are proportional to M, uh, while the spin currents are proportional to uh, the vector chiral chirality of the magnetic moments or the M cross M and the spin current, oh, sorry, I'm starting to feel a little tired here, but this is the charge current uh, which is the scalar chirality of the magnetic moment. But all these three will depend on the magnetic order, which means it will be reference dependent. So another view is that uh, in order to get to describe a complex magnetic moment is to do multi-spin, to do chiral biquadratic to do chiral multispin uh, to do biquadratic a ring exchange to do topological chiral magnetic interactions these are the papers all in, i think published in the last within 10 years yeah i think so so this is kind of a change over in in how to view these things uh, it's not according to them it's not rare uh, to have these uh, interactions and they might be important 
but they don't explain why. So I'll try now to explain why you would see that you have multi-spin interactions. So we take the spin density part now only, or first. Uh, we can see that this last term here, uh, together with this top one, contributed to Heisenberg. While these two, actually, I didn't mention, but they will go into what's called the symmetric anisotropic second rank tensor term. Uh, but forgetting that, and instead of observing that these two together give you give rise to this one, uh, which we can rewrite as here is a scalar between the spin dependent Green's functions with the potential twice, while well, here's the vector product of the Green's functions with the potential, uh, with the scalar product between the two different uh, factors. And this is minus this one. So here we have uh, uh, rewritten our, our bilinear terms. But now we say that the Green's functions are essentially proportional to the magnetic moments here for the spin dependent part. Using that, we can actually, instead of having a bilinear two terms, we can get a four spin interaction. But the interaction is in between these two uh, quantities involving four moments, uh, a double scalar or a double vector. Product. And the interaction parameter determining the size of this is given by this integral. I'll do first order variations. I don't go into detail why we do that. So we can check uh, if we take FCC uh, iron uh, as a case and view it as having four different uh, independent moments in, in the unit cell. <coughs> Let's say this origin and then there are the three uh, phase centered atoms. And we vary the moments like this, uh, which in this way we can go through uh, three different uh, magnetic orders, which are called 1q, 2q, 3q. Uh, in this, if you keep into this, we'll always find that the sum over all scalar products are equal to minus one. one. So it doesn't depend on the magnitude of, of this uh, when we vary these angles. And we can also see that there are relations in between the different combinations of the moments as one, two, three, and one, four, three, two, and so on. If theta is 45 degrees, which correspond to this picture in here, and we vary now uh, the angle, azimuthal angle from zero up to uh, 180, I don't remember actually, I have to think. Uh, we can see the variation will depend on this as a multiple angle as four cosine two theta and plus three cosine four theta. The dots here are calculated with, a, again, a full potential uh, electronic structure code. And we'll fit that perfectly uh, with this uh, term. Uh, so the bilinear terms are all cancelling out. And what you already see is this four spin. Uh, interaction, which gives the variation of this total energy. Uh, going from uh, ferromagnetic here, oh, sorry, anti-ferromagnetic uh, here, of 1K to anti-ferromagnetic of 2K, which is a coplanar structure. And in between, we go through a general order, which is a 3K structure, and that is the ground state. Now, the energy's difference, uh, energy variation looks like this, is known for a long time. And that was kind of a favorite system to look at uh, when uh, in the late 90s to start a non collinear system. Uh, but the message we had at that time was saying uh, since the spin models give uh, no variation at all, uh, these three states should be degenerate. This is coming from complex electronic structures. Uh, but now we can see we can also view it as a multi spin interaction. And if you look at the last term, we can see uh, we again have uh, this one, which gives me an extra spin. We have two spins cross uh, times each other. And here we had a three spin, uh, 
which gives five spin, and then we have to have an extra spin in order to get the expectation of the total energy uh, to get with this. So this is a six spin interaction. Uh, here is kind of saying the same thing as already I've said, that this uh, charge current part of the screen's functions is proportional to the uh, scalar vector, scalar uh, chirality uh, in non-relativistic non interaction treatment. Sorry, and if you do that, you will get an interaction of this time time uh, form with six different uh, scattering centers. And you will have uh, interaction will look like uh, uh, two different scalar Tiprat uh, chirals uh, to, to multiply with each other. Uh, we can also get that from a strained FCC. Uh, if you took a FCC we had before with iron, but if we strain it, you can see there are new terms popping up. So this is for manganese. We have the shape of it is actually maximum for 3K and a minimum of 1K. But if you start to strain it, we can see that also the six spin interaction uh, increases. So this is zero at the not zero strain and we increase the strain, the six spin interaction increases in magnitude. And we would add up to such uh, orange curve. And actually, if you strain it uh, uh, to extreme, so the uh, in principle independent layers uh, far apart, uh, this gives rise to this free ML uh, study, which was already started already for the orbital moments, which must also be studied for the total energies. And we can see that also this is well uh, fitted. Um, by now uh, the four spin interaction together with this six spin interaction. Uh, there are some uh, term here which are not uh, treated by the fitting, uh, which looks like that. I have played around a little to understand that, but I've not really got any uh, advances in that. And we can also see when we did this study, we noticed that the ground state uh, uh, pointed out before it's not really the true ground state but that's uh, actually the 2k structure and not uh, this structure so this was some uh, examples i come now to i think starting the summary of my talk so i talked about complex magnetic order and its spontaneous spin and charge currents I pointed out the, the importance to understand the magnetic symmetry and how that uh, determine uh, the different uh, par properties of these uh, magnetic orders. Uh, for instance, I discussed the rotational axes and time mirror plates. I'll use both of these uh, later on in my discussion. Uh, so observable as to these uh, spontaneous currents, which are not there due to transport uh, experiments, but are there already before any external fields. Uh, that would be the orbital moments, if you also include intraatomic uh, hopping uh, in order to get these uh, orbital moments. And also in the exchange couplings in the uh, energy, uh, curves you can see in these magnetic systems. So what we did here, we used the first order formulation uh, to calculate interactions, exchange couplings. Uh, we did the green, Green's free, uh, Green's function decomposition, uh, uh, which also utilized time reversal symmetry. We get a bilinear spin model, which has valid uh, for all different uh, orientations, but it is reference dependent. It handles DMI and also allows for non relativistic DMI due to the uh, non collinearity of the magnetic order. We can go back and map this uh, into a multi spin model by doing a further on in our uh, treatment of the Green's functions, uh, which is less reference dependent. 
And then the question arises, uh, do there exist unique spin models? Uh, that's a question I will not uh, answer. Uh, but there are at least two complementary ways to view this uh, spin interactions in the in this complex magnetic order. Uh, and I like when you can go from one to the other and think of it. It's definitely much more important, uh, easier to calculate these interactions uh, in this way, uh, because that's just a bilinear one. Uh, but it will only give you uh, uh, limited validity of that spin model you calculate. Uh, so it's more like a local valid spin model. While this would be a more a global spin model, but the, there is no way, clear way how to, which terms to include and to get a general, the, the infinite in, uh, terms to be calculated. I will thank you for your acknowledgement. I will also thank my collaborators, either from Uppsala, but also uh, some from the color Brazilian collaborators. Thank you. Great, hey, thanks. Um, thanks very much for your uh, for your talk. I, I guess Marco's not um, not here right now, so I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions at the end. But you know, um, uh, thanks for the talk uh, and uh, any questions, especially from from students. Postdocs as well. Indrajit, you're here from Marco's group. Maybe you want to ask a question. Let me just um, start us off. So, so you talked about some very interesting compounds, for example, um, manganese 3 tin. Um, and it's it's known now that manganese 3 tin is a wild metal, um, you know, with these two wild nodes. Um, and then we, we 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 know there's a fair amount of stuff that is associated with that. Um, so so you 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 calculated the magnetic moments using this kind of current density functional theory, um, how much uh, contribution do the magnetism of manganese 310 um, are from the electronic bands, particularly close to the well nodes? Or are you able to comment? Uh, it's a bit hard to say since you, know, you don't really look at that kind of stuff. You know? It's just a question. Yeah, I mean, these wide points are, quite common. I mean, they're of importance if they're close to the firmer level. Uh, since this is a metal to start with, uh, I think it's a little coincidence uh, whether they are close. Yes, that's close right. So, so some experimentalists like to claim right now, the couple of Japanese um, experimentalists who make manganese 310 who like to claim that the firm energy is very close to the wild points. Um, and uh, yeah. they, this gives rise to a very large Nernst effect. Um, or anomalous nodes to fit. Yes. So, yes. So maybe you could comment a little bit, you know, how important are the well nodes uh, for the magnetism that you uh, kind of, you know, calculate using your current density functional theory? Or are they not? Yeah, the uh, I think they might. Um, what we, how we notice when we do calculations is that we get very sensitive to the K point mesh. Uh, if it's very sensitive, that points out there are some complicated crossing or anti-crossing uh, occurring close to the family level. But I think it's more important for, for, for transport. I mean, that's the experiments pointing it out. Uh, for the total energy, you have to integrate with the full Brian zone to get the energies. And there it doesn't contribute as much. Uh, I see. Uh, but, but we are looking to see whether uh, these topological uh, bands uh, do also uh, change or contribute to more uh, cohesive properties, not only transport properties. Uh, it's not so easy, uh, but I think it's also in principle there are if you go to the currents, the formation of currents, I can see that anti-crossing can have a huge impact on the expectation value of, of these um, currents uh, that I've seen in some models we have done calculations on. Uh, but it has to be close to the Fermi levels. So the anti-crossing is not integrated out. Uh, but it's an open area uh, and uh, 
there is a huge interest in in these crossings, yeah. wild states, and everything. Yeah. No, I just, I just, sometimes I it is. Wondered, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, any questions from students? Other people? All right, let me just ask one last question, and maybe a very quick question, maybe a quick answer. Um, so you you calculate these observables, which magnetization um, observables that you you say that you, you say you don't really calculate transport. So how, how can you go from your, is there a simple way of going from your calculations using, you know, characteristic functional theory to, to transport observables? Well, there are different kinds of transport. Uh, a spin current, for example, yeah. like, you know, um, transport spin current is induced by an electric field. Yes, I mean, you can calculate anomalous Hall effect, which is more an integrated property, uh, it's a topological property. Uh, uh, otherwise, transport is dirty in that sense, it depends on imperfections, and imperfections is always how to model it. I see. Uh, but if you look at more of these topological aspects, uh, yes, there are kind of, people are using similar codes to do these calculations. I see. It's not just my main interest. Uh, but in principle, I think I just for fun did calculations. So what you do is, if you have the band structure, you feed it into uh, another code and do the calculations on the anomalous whole effect. Uh, so that's possible to do. Okay, well, thank you. And for instance, my, I mentioned Kübler, uh, he was actually my faculty opponent a long time ago when I defended my PhD. So I have had contact with him and he is now a lot into these uh, topological uh, transport things, anomalous all effects and manganese 3 tin, I think you have seen. Yeah. If you're aware of, of, of studies, you, you should maybe also be aware of his studies together with um, Felscher. And, uh, but he's doing the calculation still, although he's not young, 80 something. Uh, he's doing some, still some calculations. Okay, well, very good. Um, okay, uh, any more questions from anyone else? Maybe students, especially students? Well, um, if there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker for today, Losh. Um, you know, thank, thank you very much for spending the time. Um, Trung, you can maybe stop recording. Um, so thanks, thanks a lot for this. Um,